On this episode, we visit Vancouver, British Columbia for Placemaking Week. Then we learn about the transportation initiative of the Project for Public Spaces. The Vancouver Public Space Network champions public spaces in the city. Finally, we drop in on a Canadian placemaking workshop. Stay tuned! We're in Vancouver, British Columbia, talking with Mark Plotz with Project for Public Spaces. What is PPS? PPS is a nonprofit based in New York City, and it's dedicated to making sure that we everyone has access to quality public spaces. Why are you in Vancouver this week? We're in Vancouver this week for Placemaking Week, which is one half pro walk, pro bike, pro place, and the other half the Placemaking Leadership Forum. And of course, we're in Vancouver because it's a world leader in providing for active transportation. Over half of all trips now are done by walking, biking, and transit, at, at, least, at least on the island, uh, a little less in the, out, out in the suburbs, but uh, it's a great place to come and learn the best practices for protected bike lanes, protected infrastructure, wonderful coordination of land use and, and public transportation, and they also have a very strong uh, emphasis here on placemaking, so it seemed like a, a natural fit for our people. What were the themes this year for Pro Walk, Pro Bike, Pro Place? Well, our theme was moving towards a healthier world, and we explored that through four, four focus areas of mobility, governance, health, and resilience. So, what sort of people were at that conference, and uh, you know, what uh, what they talk about that fit into those themes? Okay, well, this year we were about a third Canadian uh, and two thirds American, with a mix of international people. Uh, we had a very strong turnout with this conference from the public health community and, and that's something that we found in Vancouver which we haven't found in other host cities is that uh, there are two big universities here and, and they have an urban studies program and they've got a public health program and, and so a lot of people who graduate from those programs then go on to work in city government or the city or the public health agencies here so uh, that's something that's been new for the conference this year is we've got a very strong academic and a very strong public health component. We had our health plenary had four doctors in it uh, and so that was that was really great. Is that uh, something that changed uh, over the decades that you know a couple decades ago it may have been injury prevention people would be here but now it's uh, you know chronic disease prevention? Yeah uh, over the years, our conference has really evolved in our audience. So, uh, you know, when we began in 1980, of course, we were a room full of zealous nuts, bike pet advocates, media in Nashville, and there were a hundred of us. I wasn't there, I was five. Uh, but then, you know, they organized and they got very good at asking for what they want. And that led to, you know, the creation of a multimodal iced tea. And so then, uh, now, some of the advocates then graduated in, into the civil service and became state bike ped coordinators, and so we added that component to us. And the public health people have always been a part of the conversation. Mostly it's been on the injury prevention side, but now it's uh, broadening in scope to talk about um, physical inactivity and chronic disease. And also this year, uh, we had some people on our health panel talked about uh, environmental health and you know exposure to air pollution that's caused by uh, you know land use planning and, and too many cars on the road and, and air pollution what the secondary effects of those are asthma uh, low birth weight uh, reduced IQ in some cases uh, and and then we had Dr. Mindy Folov who you know took it even one step further she's a psychiatrist and she talked about how transportation impacts happiness and well-being and so we're, we're continuing to to broaden the conversation and and I think it's been you know a, a very useful thing for our community you know we don't we don't need to master economics and we don't need to master uh, you know education and housing and all these other things but we need to be very aware of them and, I, and so what I'm really pleased with is that we you know we're, we're stepping out of our silos of just thinking about transportation yeah, it was the first half of the week. 
now that we're getting towards the end of the week, what's the other half of placemaking week? <laughs> well, I've got a lot less to do with that. So uh, I, you know, it's a different audience. And, and so we had about 100 people who are attending both events. And, you know, we're, we're trying to bring placemaking into our world. We did that with, uh, we started doing that in 2012 because placemaking is about creating destinations that people care about. And so you, you walk and you bike to get there. And, uh, you know, then the placemaking week now is uh, the placemaking leadership forum. And, and so this is really one of the first times that we're, it's like everything is beginning again. So pro walk, actually pro bike back in the day, 2000, uh, 1980, uh, that was advocates. There wasn't a discipline that, that addressed bicycling and walking. They got that. Now we're back here with place and it's a lot of advocates and we're trying to figure out how to embed ourselves now in, in government and in development and in transit and in transportation. So it's in a lot of ways, like this is very much like 1980 was for the biking and walking movement. We're here now in 2016 and it's the placemaking movement. And after a very busy week, everybody goes home. Yep. Uh, what what do those people do when they get home, and and what does the PPS staff do when you get back to your New York office? You know, what the, <laughs> what what's the follow up? What's the next step? Well, we're all gonna high five each other because we had a really great week here. Um, we start planning the next conference. I start planning 2018. Uh, we'll do some wrap up with the locals. 2018 is going to be in New Orleans, and in a lot of cases, it's it's very much the opposite of Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver is is very dense. Um, there's much more investment in active transportation, and New Orleans is very place oriented, and there's not as much infrastructure there. So. I think the next conference, we're going to spend even less time in our conference venue and, and more time out in the community, learning about the place from the people who live there and trying to apply our, our skills, what we've got to offer to uh, you know, improving their transportation networks. We're talking with Gary Toth, who's the Director of Transportation Initiatives for the Project for Public Spaces. Hi, John. What Welcome does, to Vancouver. Thank you. Uh, what does the Director of Transportation Initiatives do? Well, at the Project for Public Spaces, obviously streets and transit are a very important part of placemaking. It could be a, a big supporter of it or it could be an impediment. So at PPS, I take my knowledge gained or my extensive career in transportation and work with the placemaking folks to try to find the best fit. And uh, is this something that's relatively new, people thinking about transportation and places in the same thought? Well, it's, what's relatively new is that it's catching on. Uh, we just saw in the plenary session downstairs a video of Jane Jacobs talking about it, so she's obviously been thinking about it along with other folks going back to the 40s and 50s. But the resurgence is what's relatively new. If you go back, however, before the dawn of the automobile, I mean, they do a lot of presentations and talks about the fact that prior to the dawn of the automobile, you did have uh, uh, streets fitting into the community. People thought very carefully about it because they were an important part of the community. Um, we got away from that after World War II with the excitement about the car and the economies and freedoms that it afforded us, and now people are beginning to go back. Now, when you're working on an initiative like that, uh, you know, what, who, who do you have to bring in? What other organizations do you have to bring in to, to make this work, to get the knowledge out to where it needs to be? Well, it varies on what we're doing. Um, we do a lot of projects where we work in communities, and so when we go there, you know, we work with the city council, we'll work with the public works department, the parks department. We also need to bring in all the stakeholders. When we do our mission-driven work, the portion of it where we're creating resources for folks, then We'll be working with the Federal Highway Administration, sometimes the American Public Transit Authority, and other nonprofits that are playing in the same field, like Smart Growth America, Congress of New Urbanism, Walkable Livable Communities Institute, America Walk, and so on. 
What, uh, what sort of resources uh, are you creating or, or have you managed to create so far that would, would help someone out in this area? Well, at the Project for Public Spaces, the first thing I did when I got there, we got a grant from a foundation called the Bass Foundation. And during my 34 years as an engineer at the New Jersey Department of Transportation, I sat many times across the table from a, a, a citizen or a group of citizens who were frustrated because they couldn't get the answers they wanted out of the engineers and planners in my agency. There was just this big lingo gap, an uneven playing field. And so one of the first things that I did when I got the PPS was write a book called The Citizen's Guide for Communicating with Your Transportation Agencies for Better Streets. And it took about a year to write because there was a lot to write about. But I basically put in all the jargon, all the lingo, what kind of questions to answer, what do you say when they say no, how to come back on it. Um, to me, obviously, since I wrote it, it's one of my favorite resources. But we have others on our website. Uh, one is called the Lighter, Quicker, Cheaper web resource, which is a resource that helps people figure out how to do things short term without costing a lot of money. A lot of the frustration that folks have with with what's going on in, in, in the world over the last 30, 40 years is that the big projects take so long, they become controversial. So we put together a resource on how to do things quickly and inexpensively, like earlier in this week when you saw the portable seating and the little parklet out here. And we have other resources. We have a Streets as, Spaces, Streets as Places web resource, which explains how can you return our streets of the 21st century back towards that majestic quality, not unlike what we see out here on Garage Street in Vancouver. Now when you go into a town uh, and you're talking about, you know, you're coming in and who has to be there, uh, you know, they probably know, well, we'll have the Parks Department there. Mm -hmm. Are they a little surprised sometimes when you say, where are your transportation folks? Mm -hmm. No, the transportation, I mean, oftentimes my particular part of PPS mm -hmm. Is, is about transportation and it is about streets and transit. So they know that they need to bring in either their community, public works people, or the State Department of Transportation. Also, they know if they hire us, because we're not a conventional street engineering firm, we're basically a placemaking firm that helps people reframe their streets. They, they already know that we want to bring in the community. We, PPS believes that the community is the expert, so we don't come in with any solutions. We try to get the community to kind of articulate what kind of community they want to build, and then, um, then we discuss how can we reframe the streets in order to support that. So now they're not surprised by either of those things um, because that's, that's our specialty. At the conference here, you've got a lot of Americans, a lot of Canadians, mm -hmm. scattering of people from elsewhere in the world. Uh, how well does what you do, uh, you know, how, how well does it play when you, when you cross a border into a new part of the world? Well, it plays very well because um, people, people are the same everywhere, right? They have two legs, they enjoy walking, they enjoy the exercise, they enjoy the proximity to cool places. Some of us have more of a culture of being out in public places than others. But basically, in general, uh, it, it transfers very well. We learn a lot from what is going on over in Europe and in other places. And in turn, we have something to offer to them. Europe is more advanced than the United States in terms of this whole concept of streets as places and walkability. And I think that's because so much of Europe was built well, you know, three, four hundred years before the dawn of the automobile, so they had no choice but to build their communities so that you can walk around on them. They couldn't design their communities like what's happened a lot after World War II, where you can get in your car and drive 20 miles out of town to go get your clothes. So Europe has a more of a culture and heritage for accepting this, but they still have things to learn from us and vice versa. We're talking with Andrew Pass with the Vancouver Public Space Network. What is the network? 
The network is a 10-year-old organization. We just had our birthday party uh, during placemaking week uh, that works on celebrating public space in Vancouver primarily, but we also work uh, in cities beyond that. And our focus is on advocacy, research, uh, placemaking and intervention work, uh, and a variety of other activities that are aimed really to celebrate the importance of public space, uh, to champion public space in a, as an important component of uh, cities and of the urban fabric, uh, and to figure out ways that we can improve public space around Vancouver and the region. Just what is public space? Public space is a wonderful but somewhat nebulous concept. Uh, to us it includes the sort of um, typical forms of public space that include parks and plazas and streets, uh, but it also uh, accounts for things like libraries, for community centres, for the important places where people gather. Uh, to us it's not just uh, the space that is purely uh, owned uh, by the public or by the local government, uh, but also spaces where public uh, members of the public gather and celebrate and recreate. So sometimes it also involves spaces that are privately owned, the so-called privately owned public spaces as well. Does that get complicated when you have a privately owned space that's trying to act as a public space? Uh, well, it, it, it does in a number of ways. Uh, it creates some interesting challenges from a regulatory perspective, and there have been some very interesting um, court cases around what, uh, what, what counts as public space. Uh, it also imposes some very interesting questions around designing public space, um, because a lot of times when we have these private public spaces, uh, they're created with uh, the notion uh, that developers or landowners will be allowed to develop perhaps higher buildings in exchange for providing a public benefit. Uh, so the public should know that these spaces are available for them. Sometimes they're designed in, an, in a way that allows or invites people in and, and other times less so. So there's a design dimension that, that is really key to, to that discussion as well. I shall say though that um, public space has got lots of gray areas uh, and the concept, uh, although it seems in a way straightforward, um, has a lot of uh, fuzziness to it. Uh, it's a very interesting notion. Uh, what is public space? What makes the public space work well versus one where nobody ever uses it? It's a, a, a key question, isn't it? Um, to our mind, uh, public spaces work well when people feel a sense of invitation to step into the space, uh, to stay there, to linger, to participate in activities that are going on. Uh, one of the key drivers of successful public spaces is ensuring that they have a, a surrounding array of uses that are conducive to people coming into the public space. Um, not just for a couple of hours a day at lunchtime, but throughout the day uh, and into the evening uh, for special events. Um, good public spaces also uh, have, uh, in many respects, a, a certain intuitive dimension to them. Um, when there is the need for a protest or for, uh, a, you know, an impromptu celebration, it's the it's the place that you know people think, oh, let's go meet at the square, uh, and and have that protest or or celebrate whatever whatever has happened that, that, um, that is worth celebrating. So I, I think there's, um, there's a strong set of design dimensions that go along with that. A space should be accessible, uh, it should have uh, an array of uses around it, um, but it also has, uh, has a sort of culture of, of use as well. Should be designed well for, uh, for people of all ages, uh, genders, abilities, uh, economic um, backgrounds and so on. Uh, it should truly be a space that works well for everyone. And a city like Vancouver, is there one agency or department that's in charge of public space, or, or how does that work? Well, in, in Vancouver, we actually have uh, a number of different government agencies that are responsible uh, for that, or, or I should say uh, departments of, of the city. Uh, so we have a park board. Uh, the, the parks board uh, is a separate elected entity uh, that looks after about 220 parks in the city of Vancouver, uh, and they also manage street trees. We have an engineering department that is uh, mandated to look after the road uh, right of way, uh, and so they will um, they will they will be dealing with streetscapes. But they also have certain plazas that are in the road right of way. Uh, you also have um, the city's real estate department that has other land ho holdings as well. So there isn't any one uh, there, w there isn't any one agency at the local level. Uh, and then to make things more interesting, the provincial government, because uh, we have a provincial government in, in Canada and BC here, uh, also has uh, certain uh, land holdings, uh, including Robson Square, one of the, the preeminent spaces in Vancouver. 
Uh, and beyond that, we also have federal government and other agencies uh, that, uh, that have um, land holdings as well that, that fill uh, public space functions. So what sort of things do you do to, to carry out your mission? Well, the, the, the VPSN is actually, I, I think, uh, an interesting organization. When we started it uh, 10 years ago, we were uh, literally maybe eight, perhaps 10 people sitting around a table at a community center and had a variety of different interests in, in public space. Uh, some people were interested in guerrilla gardening, others uh, uh, the proliferation of billboards and, and concerns around privatizing public space. Others were concerned about uh, matters of policing and ensuring spaces that are safe. And we recognize that, that uh, the common thread in all of this is public space and, and the way that that concept ties together a, a variety of different issues. So we have people coming from various different um, starting points uh, that um, gives our volunteer base a very rich and diverse uh, quality. But then beyond that, we have people that are um, that are coming with different uh, interests or abilities uh, or projects in mind because we, we are uh, very collaborative in terms of how we do our projects. So some people and some of the work we do is research based, you know, going out and mapping all of the surveillance cameras or the billboards or things like that in the city. Um, others are more uh, focused on intervention, activation, placemaking, uh, even some of the ephemeral events, uh, the, the sort of flash mob style activities. Um, so an example there, we do an annual Halloween Skytrain party where we tell everyone to dress up in their finest Halloween costume, show up on our Skytrain line, we wheel uh, a sound system in and a DJ, and for one ride around this, the, uh, the, the transit loop, uh, about an hour, we transform that. Um, that SkyTrain ride into a dance party. It's great fun. Very ephemeral, once a year, it's there and then it's, it's gone. So there's that sort of stuff. Um, we do a lot of communications and advocacy with the local governments uh, as well. Uh, that can be letter writing, it can be um, working with them uh, to try and shape the policy that's being developed that uh, uh, enables public space. Um, really just trying to champion the importance of a public space lens uh, with, uh, with the policies, the bylaws, the guidelines that are being developed. So we, we try to touch upon uh, each of those areas of activity and, and more. And a city like Vancouver, that's you've been getting denser with a lot of high-rise buildings going up. How does that affect the importance of public space? Uh, it makes it ever more important by the day. I mean, uh, public space is vital to any city's uh, well-being and, and the, the functioning of cities. Um, but as cities grow, as they densify, as they get more people in, and as also the population uh, becomes more heterogeneous, uh, you get a, a greater array of people coming from uh, other places in the world, um, you know, that, that notion of uh, ensuring that space is designed uh, to fulfill a variety of needs, that uh, it remains open and accessible and uh, something that uh, everyone can participate in um, becomes ever more important and, and, and uh, thus more of a challenge for cities as well and an opportunity as well. Uh, to, to make that all happen. So uh, absolutely as Vancouver, particularly in the downtown area as it grows, um, we need to make sure that we keep working to see our public spaces vital, open, uh, engaging for, for the community at large. We're in Vancouver talking with Robert Plitt with Evergreen. What is Evergreen? Uh, Evergreen is a national environmental charity focused on building better cities. What's been going on here this afternoon? Well, this afternoon we've hosted a uh, Made in Canada placemaking workshop uh, with people from all over the country, from St. John's to Vancouver, uh, talking about the future of cities, about the democratization of decision making and place, um, and thinking about how we work better together as a community of practice to uh, advance um, cities that are livable, walkable, equitable, resilient, and uh, just great places to live. What's, uh, what's planning practice been like in, in Canada you know, over the you know, recent decades where you know, maybe they need to do a little more to, about you know, equity and livability and so on? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, think, I think in many ways you know, Canada has some of the greatest cities in the world. We actually do a great job at building cities. Um, you know, there is a growing divide between the haves and the haves not. So that's a that's a huge issue that um, sort of community-based 
placemaking can help uh, uh, address uh, by building more local community wealth, community investment, uh, and uh, engaging people in shaping their environment. So, so you know, I wouldn't say we're, we're you know we, we make great cities, um, you know, but affordability is a growing issue, and uh, you know, a lot of that has to do with just how we invest our resources, where we invest our resources, uh, and who has uh, uh, say in where and how those resources are. There's a fair bit of talk today about, I guess, creating a network of, of the people who are here, uh, you know, staying in touch. Um, what, what do you hope will grow, grow out of this in terms of what happens with the people in this room after they go back to all the different provinces? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, you know, I think the, the, the basis of today's conversation was to really say um, that the city is a commons. It's a place where we have all these interconnected places from libraries to churches and faith institutions to civic institutions to parks um, to kind of public-private space. And, and uh, you know, what we're hoping is that we, uh, as, as kind of city builders, we start to think really more about how are those systems interconnected with one another in better ways to build, to build value for, for residents. Uh, and that's what we're going to be discussing moving forward. Um, uh, both kind of locally, you know, we, we know so we've had a, a group here from Vancouver, from Toronto, from Halifax, so uh, sort of healthy networks of place-based local uh, change agents working together uh, and trying to figure out how we can share knowledge and exchange across cities uh, and work together to help shape policy at the local level, the provincial level, and the federal level uh, in ways that are, uh, that, you know, that align with, I think, align very much with the uh, you know, the direction that our governments are also seeing how our cities need to evolve, the importance of cities in, in Canada's future, and uh, the, 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 the power of cities to actually shape a prosperous future. There are a number of people from Evergreen here today. Uh, what, what other groups are there that you hope will be working together to you know, push forward this vision? Well, I mean, there are a lot of the groups that, that are here, uh, academic institutions like Simon Fraser Institute, we have a, a great partner in Project for Public Spaces from across the border, uh, who are international leaders in this, in this thinking, um, faith institutions, um, uh, organizations that are really focused on, on parks. So there's a lot of knowledge that's uh, kind of invested here in, in specific uh, kind of sectors. Uh, and you know the idea is how do we how do we start to bridge the you know the thinking and, and understand how we can best uh, leverage our assets and our and our organizations and our institutions. So. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.